But welcome everyone to um, our October Tune In Tuesday. Um, and we are going to be talking about how to work with uh, LGBTQ2 spirit plus youth um, in the juvenile drug treatment court. Uh, I think this is particularly important for all of you to be thinking about. Um, we know that um, kids, when they feel like, you know, they're not safe, they're having maybe macro or microaggressions going on in their lives, um, often will turn to to substance use and sometimes delinquent behavior. So um, one of the, the things that we know is that these kids um, sometimes end up more often in court and a lot of times in uh, drug court. So I want to to give you guys some really good tools to, to deal with that. Um, as always, we have our disclaimer um, that we're gonna uh, make sure that you know that everything that's happening today is not um, either a position of the federal government nor a position of NCJ, FCJ, or All Rise. Um, so I just always have to get that out of the way. Uh, so without further ado, though, I want to turn it over to our presenter. Um, Rob, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. And so take it away. Great. Thanks, Jessica. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, for joining today. Um, so yeah, as Jessica said, I'm Rob Warnoff. Uh, I've been doing this work uh, on behalf of LGBTQ plus youth for about 30 years. Um, uh, Elijah and I were just talking about, uh, I, I was a trained actor in New York or came out of training and then went to New York. Uh, and because I was on stage at night and had my days free, uh, and because it seemed like at that time AIDS was just spreading like wildfire, um, I started volunteering. And that volunteering work took me to uh, young people who were mostly queer identified, who had been kicked out of their homes or ran away from their homes uh, from unsafe situations, started volunteering with them. And that's what that took over my life. Uh, so I know a, a lot of you who have volunteered, you know how powerful that can be. Um, so just a teeny bit about me, because I do want to jump into the material uh, among many positions I've had. Uh, I was the National LGBTQ uh, Director at the Child Welfare League of America in Washington, D.C., where I ran an entire national initiative. Um, CWLA at the time was run by Shea Bilchik. Some of you who may know him, uh, he was the director of OJJDP before he was at CWLA. And now he runs the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. So he's been a great uh, ally and advocate. Uh, it, was, it was a big step for him to start this national LGBTQ initiative. Uh, and I was thrilled to be able to, uh, to go around the country and work with, it, with just about every state in the nation. Um, another position I've had, uh, the USC School of Social Work about five years ago hired me because a lot of their MSW students, most of their MSW students were going into dependency uh, systems, which is wonderful, but we need more therapeutic approaches, as a lot of you know, in our uh, in our systems of confinement and in our probation and police systems. Uh, so that pro training program at USC was to train MSW students to want to work in those systems and to come at that with a more therapeutic rather than a punitive approach. Um, I've also been an executive director and the CEO of an organization called Sanctuary Palm Springs. I live in Palm Springs, California now. Uh, and that is a transitional housing program for uh, LGBTQ plus youth who are coming out of both probation and dependency systems as we prepare them for adulthood. Um, and you may or may not know, but the FACTJJ, the Federal Advisory Committee on Juvenile Justice, has an LGBT subcommittee. Uh, and I was the uh, uh, I'm the co-chair of that uh, training subcommittee. So everything I'm going to be talking about today uh, is uh, we're talking about policy, but I also want to start off by letting you know there are resources for everything. So there are training resources, there are policy resources, there are data management collection resources. Uh, so I'm going to be holding up a number of the, these resources as we go. And as Jessica and I have talked about, uh, what we're hoping to accomplish today is to provide a certain level of information, but also sort of to whet your appetite because a one hour webinar certainly can't change systems, uh, but a deeper dive into training can. And so we'll talk a, a little bit more about what those training opportunities are uh, if you'd like to avail yourselves of them. Uh, so one thing I wanted to talk about sort of at the very beginning is sort of the distinction between equality, treating everybody the same and equity. Um, because we, a lot of people say, I treat everybody the same, which is a wonderful approach in life, uh, but it may not get us what we want, right? Because uh, context sort of has to be taken into account uh, where some of these young people are coming from, what their experiences were in their families of origin and since they've left their families, the people who've worked with them, teachers, schools, communities. Um, and so it's not always about just treating everybody the same, it's making slight accommodations. 
uh, that will then get them what they need and get them the help that they need to get them on their way. So you can see just in the, these two pictures, the equality picture shows these three boys were treated the same. They were given the same block. Um, that doesn't really help the little guy, right? He doesn't get to see the, the game. Um, but by making the accommodation, the taller boy doesn't need a block, the little boy needs two blocks. Um, so again, that's just sort of an oversimplification, but you kind of get the point. Um, all right, so you know, I think the most important thing that we can ever do when we're working with these young people is to listen. Because unlike a lot of other demographic information, uh, somebody's sexual identity or gender identity is really internal to them. And we can only know it if they tell us. And they will only tell us if they feel safe and they feel as though they can be, you know, that you can be trusted with the information they're about to share. Um, because many, many times um, they will share this information and then bad things will happen to them. They'll be rejected, they'll be hurt, they'll be made fun of, they'll be ridiculed. Uh, all of the, the reasons, the sort of the, the initial building blocks of what ultimately becomes their substance abuse and substance use and the things that you have to deal with in drug courts. Um, so the very, very first thing I did when I was hired by CWLA, and this was 20 years ago now, um, was before we wrote any policies or developed any training curricula, made recommendations to states, we wanted to hear. So I set up an entire national system of regional listening forums. And by the way, this Child Welfare League of America project was a co-project with Lambda Legal, which is a legal service organization that does a lot of impact law. Um, Lambda Legal actually wrote the very first report in 2001 called Youth in the Margins. And as I said, I'll be holding up a number of resources. You have a bibliography at the end, so you'll be able to access these. Uh, but Youth in the Margins was a very important study because it was the first time there was a national kind of re uh, research project on what are the experiences of LGBT, at the time just LGBT is what we were talking about. And I'll talk a bit more about how language evolves. Um, but when this report came out, it was really fascinating. Those of us involved in this work uh, we ordered it, we read it. I was thrilled. It's it's 200 some pages of nothing is going on in any state. <laughs> um, there was a, a director of an entire state who said, it's not a problem. I have no gay kids in my state. Now, we know that's not true and I'll talk about research in a little bit. Um, so we wanted to do something different. That research study was done by just talking to administrators. We wanted to go directly to the young people. So uh, I worked with agencies all around the country. Originally, we were just going to do about six forums. We ended up doing 14 uh, in every state. Um, I'll give one quick little example. I got a call from a social worker in Salt Lake City in Utah. Utah was not on our list of states. We were going to do a forum. And I said, why do you need uh, a forum there? And she said, we had a case recently where there was a 15-year-old girl who disclosed to her foster mom uh, that she was attracted to girls. And the foster mom's approach was to buy a bottle of vodka, give it to a boy who was a friend of this girl's. Uh, she said, I'm going to stay late at work tonight, go to the house, you two get drunk. They were 15 years old, have sex with her, rape her if you have to, because ultimately that will save her. If she has sex with a boy, that will make her heterosexual and that will be good for her in the long run. That was so offensive to everybody, but certainly to the state of Utah, that Utah became the very first state in the entire country to require LGBT training for all of its state social workers as a result of that. So we did that forum in Utah and many, many other places as well. Um, so when I do trainings, I like to start off with just talking about some of the quotes, some of the things that we heard, um, and that all went into this book. Th this Lambda study, as I talked about, was called Youth in the Margins. So I wrote a book called Out of the Margins. Uh, because we wanted to bring these issues to the forefront and realize that there are these children do exist, they do have needs, and hearing from them directly in these uh, forums was very, very powerful for sort of everybody involved. So I'm just going to run through a few of those now. There are many, many more in that book. Um, so when I was in foster care, all my foster mom would do was taunt me. My foster family took away my clothes, called me a dyke, and tried to remake me. And as I'm saying these, Go by what you know, what you, and I don't presuppose you don't know a lot of this stuff already. Um, you know, kind of listen for some, some of the, the legal violations <laughs> uh, and certainly some policy violations that are, that are being tossed out. Um, I got jumped by a bunch of guys in my group home. And when I told the director, he said, well, if you weren't a faggot, they wouldn't beat you up. It's not fair. This young man I remember was in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, since he went, he did the right thing. He went to the director, obviously got no protection. 
Uh, so he started carrying a knife to protect himself. And we all know what happens to a young person who carries a weapon in a group home. He was brought into the juvenile justice system, right? Uh, right away, a child has a personality. And if you suppress children's sexual orientation or gender identity, children are going to have major emotional problems they're never going to get rid of. Now, we know this from science. When this quote happened, uh, that's just a logical thing. Uh, research that I'm going to talk about in a li little bit has borne this out, that something called conversion therapy, trying to change somebody's sexual orientation or gender identity. The research shows that taking a child to one visit to a therapist who tries to do that increases their suicidal ideation eight times. We're just not in the business of increasing children's suicidal tendency, right? Um, so in my high school, when I came out, I didn't know who to go to. Uh, so I searched online and they had every site blocked that had the words gay, lesbian, transgender. I found thousands of sites about how to kill myself and the best way to do it, but I couldn't find one site to explain who I could go to for getting help. So again, this illustrates how we sort of shut them out of the resources that they really need to stay safe. This one always is powerful. Uh, when I was 15, I was walking down the street with my best friend and a group of guys came up to us and they asked my friend if he was gay. He said yes, and they killed him right in front of me. I ran home to tell my parents what happened and they kicked me out. My parents don't love me because I'm gay. So when we talk about trauma and multiple layers of complex trauma, compounded trauma, this is, this is a perfect example of how that starts. Obviously, this is something I'm not telling you, you don't, something you don't know, but when a young person experiences trauma like this and has that level of pain, usually if we're not reaching out to help them, they will help themselves by self-medicating. Again, they're gonna end up in a drug court at some point. Uh, I only had one lady to talk to and the rest of them weren't trying to help me out or anything. And in my first group home, they sat me down with a big family Bible and described to me why it was wrong to be gay. All right, so again, those were just some of the things that we heard. We heard hundreds and hundreds of similar expressions uh, that then motivated uh, certainly the Child Welfare League, but a lot of states and a lot of jurisdictions to start writing policies, to start training their staff, to make sure that these young people were actually getting support when they disclosed and not getting harmed more. Um, so this next section I want to run through fairly quickly in training. I spend a, a good hour or sometimes two hours on this, but just sort of breaking down uh, you may know the acronym SOGI, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Expression. Uh, a long time ago, we used to refer to these kinds of trainings as like LGBT or LGBTQ plus trainings. Um, that's very specific to a, a group of people. SOGI is more universal. Every single person has a sexual orientation. Every single person has a gender identity and ways that we express our gender. So it's more universal. Um, and why that's really come in handy now is Young people grow and evolve, right? And we think about how different we were from our parents' generations and generations that came before. Young people now don't always put themselves in the boxes that we may have put ourselves in. I'm a gay identified man. I put myself in that gay box. Um, but a lot of young people don't. Uh, sexuality, gender are much more fluid, much more expansive now. It's wonderful for them. It can make it very difficult for us. <laughs> so I'm gonna sort of talk about those concepts. Um, so you see on the... One side of the screen, sexuality includes basically three components, sexual orientation, sexual identity, and sexual behavior. Uh, sexual orientation is simply who we're attracted to. Uh, so in-person training, I ask people to, to say, you know, what happens to your body when you see someone you're attracted to, physically attracted to? You know, what, what are the responses that we have? Uh, and people always say things like, you know, my palms get sweaty and your stomach, you get butterflies and uh, your heart races. Um, and then I ask, if you had to put those into a category, would you say those are voluntary responses or involuntary? Uh, and invariably, people say involuntary, right? You don't tell your heart to race. <laughs> you don't tell your palms to sweat. It just happens. Um, but those things happen internally, right? We can't see somebody's heart race or you can't see it, you know, the butterflies in the stomach, which leads to the next uh, point about sexual identity. It's, it's then about how we talk about those feelings. We don't make those feelings happen. We can't stop those feelings, which is why it's so damaging when people, when conversion therapists try to change them, right? As I talked about that suicidal ideation. Um, so sexual identity is just how we claim ourselves in relation to those feelings. And depending on how safe we feel, how trustworthy the people who are in our lives are, uh, that'll depend on whether or not we're honest about it or not. And we all know that a lot of young people will do anything to throw people off the track uh, and when we talk about sexual behavior, um, 
if I had to ask you who gets pregnant or gets somebody pregnant more, straight kids or LGBTQ kids, it's actually the LGBTQ kids get pregnant or get somebody pregnant about three times more. Um, because if a boy gets a girl pregnant or if a girl gets pregnant, it's a great way to throw people off the track if they're same sex attracted and don't feel safe in, in disclosing that. Um, so the first two parts of that, sexual orientation and sexual identity, those are protected in the laws and policies that we're gonna be talking about. We don't police those things, um, but you absolutely can police and control sexual behavior, particularly in, in systems of confinement. Um, that's changing somebody's or, or helping a young person understand appropriate behavior is not denying who they are, it's how they act. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I kind of tease that part out. I'm not saying, and no one would ever suggest, you have to let young people do whatever they want to do. That's never the case. Um, on the other side, gender is when a baby is born, the first thing they say, right, it's a boy or it's a girl. I never think that's quite accurate. What they're saying is it's a male or it's a female, right, usually based on genitalia. Um, almost all babies very nearly are born male or female, but there's also a whole spectrum of conditions called intersex. Uh, some of you may know it as, as hermaphrodite was a, is an outdated term we don't use anymore, but intersex is a clinical biological set of conditions where a baby may be born with ambiguous genitalia or attributes of male and female. Uh, if they do more testing, they may have XYY chromosome, XXY chromosome. They may have uh, a penis and ovaries. They may have a vagina and undescended testes. Um, and, but by and large, most, uh, most babies are born male or female. The it's a boy or it's a girl part, uh, research has shown on little children that they have a very uh, clear identity in terms of their own gender by 24 to 36 months. So two year to three years old, they know if they feel like little boys or little girls or something kind of on the, the gender spectrum. Um, by the time they talk about that, maybe 10 or so years later, they've lived with this for a very long time. So if they have felt supported in their gender expression, uh, in the way, the clothes that they'd like to wear, the toys that they'd like to play with. We all know that a little boy reaches for a Tonka truck and the world is in harmony, but the little girl reaches for that Tonka truck and she's usually, it's taken away from her and she's given a doll. Uh, conversely, if the boy reaches for a doll and wants to play with dolls, we take them away. Um, we don't teach boys to be very nurturing. And then we wonder 25, 30, 35 years later why they're not good parents, but that's a whole other sort of set of discussions. Um, but you see how kind of those things play out as well. So I just wanted to kind of throw those out there uh, just so we're all kind of speaking the same language. Um, we have lots of letters. When I started doing this work, the very first job I got was uh, to run the Massachusetts governor uh, uh, Governor's Commission on Gay and Lesbian Youth. That's all we were talking about at the time, almost 30 years ago. Uh, those definitions have expanded as we've come to understand bisexuality certainly gender identity and that people cross the gender lines, transgender. Uh, some people are queer, some people questioning two spirit that in indigenous cultures, uh, there's a fluidity of gender and sexuality that wasn't always condemned. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Living the Spirit where it talked about a lot of two spirited people being very revered uh, in their communities. Um, the, the, the letters, the acronyms, there's no right way. There's no one way to do it. Please don't get uh, sort of tied up in it. Um, in training, I do do a long piece on definitions so that we can really understand what we're talking about. But um, words and languages, language evolves all the time. So uh, I like to kind of wrap up a terminology section with this quote, who's a, a fictitious, fictitious character named Mrs. Madrigal, who's a, a, a trans woman who runs a boarding house in San Francisco in Armistead Muppin's Tales of the City books. And at one point, uh, a character goes up to her and says, Mrs. Madrigal, the world is changing so much I can't keep up. And she says, you don't have to keep up, dear. You just have to keep open. And I think that's sort of an, an umbrella for all of this, right? Young people will always be ahead of us and they will always have language and terms and ways of talking about themselves uh, that we just, we, we go to training and we learn a set of things and we think we got it and then it's changed. And I know that that can have an impact on us to want to shut down. And, but I think if we just stay open, um, it sort of doesn't matter because you may have a gay identified kid one day, a queer identified kid another day, a two-spirited kid identified another way, another day, and their identity may shift uh, as they go. Um, but again, if we, if we just stay open to hearing them, um, that's a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, 
so, you know, as I talked about in the, the Youth in the Margin study, there was a state director who said, I have no gay kids, so it's not a problem. Uh, there's been a lot of research now uh, on the numbers of LGBTQ youth in, in systems, um, and it's uniformly about 20%. So it's at least one in five uh, kids who are LGBTQ identified who are in our systems of care. Um, young people on the street, it's much, much more than that. Um, usually about 25 to 40% because they are doubly rejected right? They're rejected by their families of origin. They come into our systems of care. And if they're rejected even further, then their next stop is usually to run away. And I know all of you have worked with runaway and, run, run away and homeless youth. Um, there's one resource I wanted to hold up. This is a book called Street Child. Uh, it's in the bibliography. If you want to read this, this is a harrowing experience, but it touches every single base of what we talk about here. Um, this was a, a very effeminate little boy whose father thought he would toughen him up by beating him. To make him tougher. Uh, those beatings were, you know, brought to the attention of CPS. He was brought into care. He was abused further in foster care. He ran away. He was on the street starting at 10 years old and didn't get off the streets until he was almost 30. And so in this book, he really talks about all of his experiences with substance use, with mental health issues, with addiction, um, in and out of incarceration, juvenile incarceration, adult incarceration. Um, this would be unreadable, except it has a happy ending because he also went into recovery, forgiveness, healing. He thrives as an adult. He's he's in his fifties now, and his minimum uh, job salary is two twenty five a year, which is a lot more than a lot of us make working in this business, right? So, he, uh, uh, it has a happy ending. So it's Street Child. It's a it's a wonderful resource. Um, again, we're going to go over briefly the laws and the, the policies. Um, but you have them here in the slide, so I don't want to spend a lot of time just reading them, but just know that, as I said, there are a lot of, um, a lot of best practice guidelines. There are a lot of uh, federal constitutional protections that are built into these uh, policy guides for you to follow. Uh, so I'm going to go through a, a bit of those as we go. Um, but starting off with the constitutional protections that youth in custody have a right uh, to their identities, uh, to be uh, secure, reasonably safe, freedom from psychological harm, from physical uh, or psychological uh, harm as well, and adequate care. Um, so again, I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'm not gonna read through every single one of these. But things like uh, Title IV-E, Title IV-B, the Foster Care Independence Act, the Affordable Care Act, Title IX, these all have protections. I'm gonna talk about PREA in a, in a few minutes as well. Um, so as you, you know, think about this, does your agency or organization have non-discrimination policies? Non-discrimination policies are a very first step because we're never talking about challenging anyone's belief system here, right? We're talking about the day-to-day -day practice at work. Uh, and those things can be guided by policies. People get to believe what they get to believe. Um, when I was running PREA projects, I had a deputy once say to me um, when we were doing an LGBTI, because PREA includes intersex uh, people as well, we were doing some training and this deputy said to me before the training, uh, talking about these issues violates everything I believe in, my whole belief system, my culture, my faith, everything I was brought up to believe. He said, none of that matters the second I put on my uniform. The second I put on my uniform, I'm the sheriff's deputy and I will follow all of the laws and policies in place that guide my practice. And I thought, man, if that guy can get it, <laughs> if everybody can just sort of adopt that attitude, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll tell a little story. When I was in Boston, I worked with a, a co-worker who was also a foster parent, and uh, she was about to adopt one of the kids in one of my peer education programs. It was about 15 years old, a gay boy. Um, and that was great. Um, as the process was going on through the courts, uh, this gay boy started to identify as a girl and started to address as a girl and wanted to be addressed as a girl. Uh, and right before the finalization hearing, the foster mom said to her, uh, you can stay with me as a boy or you can leave as a girl. And so the, the adoption didn't happen and this young child's heart was broken because we know at 16, it's very difficult to get adopted. Um, so that was very difficult for her. The only reason it affected me was this foster mom, as I said, was also a colleague of mine. We had the same supervisor and I went to my boss and said, I can't work with her. And my supervisor said, then quit. You have to work with her. When you come to work, I expect you to be professional. Why I tell this story is my supervisor also said, I will create a safe space for you to come into my office, close the door and say whatever you want about that woman. And it's safe. So you can vent. 
but when we're out on the floor and in working as a team, I expect you to be professional. And about a year later, she pulled me aside and she said, do you still hate her? And I went, oh yeah, I do. <laughs> and she said, well, I haven't seen any sign of it. And I went, right, thank you. Because you give me that safe space to talk about it so that I can maintain my professionalism. Um, so I bring that up because again, my feelings about that woman had nothing to do with anything. The agency's policies though dictated that we work together. So as long as you stick, anybody sticks to the policy, you're never gonna run afoul. Uh, and again, it takes out any of the, the feelings uh, and the beliefs that we may have. Uh, but having non-discrimination policies, are it's a good start, but it's only a start, right? Um, not discriminating against somebody is a good thing, but what the message that we wanna send to young people is, I am here for you. I am here not just to not do something bad to you, I'm here to help you. And I'm excited to work with you and I validate who you are. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be working with you and I'm very happy to be working with you. Those are the kinds of things that are not usually stated in policy. Uh, and they come out in body language and, and the way that we talk to them and, and the relationships that we develop. And again, if young people feel safe and feel like you're trustworthy, they will tell you more about them, about them and their experiences and their feelings and their identities, which will then help you plan a better course of action for them. Conversely, if you just say, you know, I'm working with you because my agency tells me I have to because it's in our non-discrimination policy, not real likely a young person's gonna disclose much, won't really help you. So again, you know, there are, there are a lot of guidelines for you. Uh, two resources I wanna hold up. Uh, one is um, this, again, this is in the, the guide, uh, the, the bibliography, uh, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Youth in Juvenile Justice Systems. And then this report, called Hidden Injustice. This is sort of the big one. Um, this came out of a, a project called the Equity Project, which was a collaboration among many, many organizations led by uh, the National Juvenile Defender Center, Legal Ser Services for Children, and the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and then many other organizations that came together to do research, to develop policy templates, training templates, uh, training practices. There's a four-day training module uh, uh, that they've developed. Um, this again is in the bibliography, and if you get no other resource, this is the thing that's going to help you the most. Um, because nobody's going to ask you to develop these things out of whole cloth. It's all here for you. And again, that's what I hope we accomplish in this webinar today is to, to help you understand there is everything out there for you. Um, so training, again, um, you know, when I started this work a long time ago, we were sort of making it up as we went along. And now there are a lot of very sophisticated trainings. Uh, there are trainings that are just designed for uh, sort of dependency systems, for social workers working in those systems. Uh, the Human Rights Campaign in D.C., HRC, has a wonderful set of training curricula, three different trainings, um, working with families. So to get children out of systems and back into families, so whether that's recruiting LGBT foster and adoptive families or working to heal the families uh, uh, from where the kids come in the first place to keep the kids in a family system. Um, the American Bar Association has this guide called Opening Doors for Lawyers and Judges. So there's training available in uh, courts as well. Um, so again, it's just sort of a matter of uh, availing yourselves of these systems. And as Jessica and I have talked about, um, there's not only trainings available for you, but they're also training for trainers. So trainers can go in and train your trainers so that your systems can keep this work going on an ongoing basis, um, because that's actually how we make the best kind of systems change. Um, so, you know, training staff is a wonderful thing. Training should be ongoing. Training should address the needs for affirming and respectful care that is really, that's inclusive of, of SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Um, does your agency collect information? And this has sort of been uh, a, a sort of a difficult thing. It starts off, as I've talked about, with the trust that young people feel in us because this relies on self-disclosure. If they don't feel like they can trust us, they're not going to tell us. Uh, Priya tells us that we have to interview everybody who comes in related to their sexual orientation or gender identity. But as you know, that is at their, they're at their most traumatized when they're coming into those kinds of systems. And again, they're likely not to trust, so they're going to tell you the wrong thing. Um, so about 13, 14 years ago, there was a large national convening where about 25 experts came together, spent several days looking at how do we collect this information, what are the trainings necessary, the policies, the sort of the, sort of the infrastructural uh, systems that need to be put in place so that people who work directly with young people can have the kinds of conversations 
through which young people will then disclose. So that's when we talk about data collection, how do we capture that information? Um, then what do we do with it once we have it? Where do we capture it? We all have to write reports. There are systems we have to enter in data. How do we enter those data uh, and manage those data in a way that actually reflect what the young person has told us? So a lot of systems have adapted their data management systems to, to, to be more expansive and to use language more in a, in a larger, more um, sort of realistic way, uh, according to how young people talk. Because if we only had sort of the LGBT boxes, that won't fit a lot of the young people's uh, identities. Uh, and then the third part of that was, how do we disclose it? With whom do we share it? Who needs to know, right? Lawyers, judges, caseworkers, um, at times families, but what are the ramifications of those people knowing what will they do with the information? So as I've talked about, there's another set of guidelines and it's just called managing data. Again, that's in the bibliography. Um, and that breaks out those three sections about how to collect, how to manage, and how then how to disclose those or share those data. This is a lot, lot of what I talked about. Um, so Priya really was, that advanced this uh, ish, these issues uh, in a very big way. As, as I'm sure you all know, Priya is now 20 years old, uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. It was meant to keep uh, people safe from uh, sexual assault in all systems of confinement. Um, and as the Priya standards were being developed, um, we saw people who were working on that saw the need to, to be very inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity, because as with other systems, people who were outside of being straight, heterosexual, or not transgender, cisgender is the term for that. Cis just means aligned. So when your sex at birth aligns with your gender identity, that's cisgender. Um, anybody who falls outside of that was at much greater risk for uh, sexual harm in systems of confinement. So PREA has been a wonderful guideline, right? This is federal law. The standards are very, very explicit about how to work with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people. Um, and then drug testing, uh, particularly with, with trans youth. So um, before I get into that, I wanna talk a bit about uh, a wonderful research initiative called the Family Acceptance Project at San Francisco State University. Uh, this is a wonderful institute that's been studying LGBTQ youth for 25 years or more. Um, that's how we have a lot of the data that we have. Uh, this is a wonderful practice guide. Again, that's in the bibliography. The Family Acceptance Project has materials in many, many languages um, that really help us understand what are the emotional tolls that are taken on young people that drive their substance abuse in the first place, right? Young people who are loved, nurtured, cared for, supported, uh, have very little need for any drug use uh, aside from just sort of regular adolescent exploration and, 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 um, and that kind of very informal use. But the kind of addiction that we're talking about, as we all know, is there to numb pain. And that pain is caused by the levels of acceptance or rejection that they talk about. Um, so some of the resources the Family Acceptance Project has is a number of videos. Um, and one of those videos uh, it's called Always My Son, and it's, it's wonderful. I use it in training all the time. It, it starts off with a very sort of machizo Latino man who starts in the video by firing a gun. He was a Marine. He wanted his son to grow up to be just like him. Uh, and what he got was a son who was nothing like him uh, and who liked to play, with, make dresses and play with dolls. And he was a gay kid, not a trans kid, um, but a very effeminate boy. And the father didn't like that at all. And as the son was growing up, he he sensed more and more his father's rejection of him, uh, which then fueled the young boy's substance abuse. And it's only when the child almost died from alcohol poisoning one night that the father said, you know what, it's not my son who has to change, it's me. If I don't change, I'm going to lose my child. Uh, and it's a very, very powerful message because again, he's not a social worker, this guy, he's just a guy. Uh, and really saw what he, how his behaviors were the driving force in his son's substance use. Um, conversely, then loving his son, embracing his son for exactly who he was over time, that's how the young person went into recovery and that recovery lasted. Um, so I just kind of, kind of wanted to bring that up. I'm sure you all know a lot of that, um, but particularly with trans youth because they have um, many, many levels of, of discrimination and rejection, right? I think 
the world in general, our society certainly has gotten more accommodating of, of sexual orientation of, of gay and lesbian rights. Same sex marriage is legal. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things have changed in terms of that. But we all know right now in particular, trans youth are under assault uh, by many, many, many states. And we can continue that. It will make them feel very bad about themselves. It will drive them into the streets. It will drive them into the kinds of things young people need to do on the streets to survive, as we know, stealing, sex work, drugs. Um, all the reasons then eventually when we capture them and we bring them back into our court system, we try to get them on a better path and to heal them. What we're not healing a lot of times is that original trauma that could have been skipped all along if they had just been accepted for who they are at the beginning, right? So a lot of the organizations that we work with and the systems that we have in place, when we leave out the family component, we're leaving out a, a big opportunity because that's where the initial sort of security can be instilled in them. And young people who feel safe and secure and loved, um, as I said, are not at risk of being on the street and all the things that come with that. Um, so once trans youth in particular, as I talked about the young woman who I worked with in Boston, who came this close to being having an adoptive mother who didn't adopt her simply because of her trans identity. She was the same young person who was never in trouble, never in, in, in trouble, never got sent to the principal's office. She was a great student in her spare time. She would read Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, the, the, the pain that she felt, and I'm gonna use this one child as an example and you'll hear why in just a second. Um, the pain that she felt from that rejection where she had already been rejected by her family of origin, right? Um, to have those expectations and those hopes built up again, and then to have those shattered once again, uh, obviously drove substance use. Fortunately, she had our peer programs to come to and to be safe. Um, I ended up sort of mentoring her for many, many years, and eventually I adopted her myself. And she has a, an MSW now, and she's out in the world doing great things. She also got a full scholarship, so... <laughs> which wasn't a bad thing, but, and that full scholarship was from something called the Point Foundation, which funds specifically LGBTQ youth. Um, so the identity that was sort of causing her a lot of problems at the beginning of her life has sort of paid off um, now, but she also does a lot of training with organizations. And as a black trans woman who grew up in foster care, um, she has a lot to say. Um, that's just one example, but you, we see, you, we can see how we have the power to kind of determine their trajectory or not. So, in terms of the drug testing, once they are in our systems, a lot of it is uh, you know, unobserved testing because a lot of young people, there's no universal way to transition. A lot of times it has to do with access to healthcare. So transition, can, the easiest form of transition is clothing, right? Um, young people in care have a right to wear clothing that expresses their gender identity. They have that right to do that. Um, that doesn't mean they have the right to wear anything they want. Quick other little story. Uh, when I was in Boston and I developed a group home for LGBT youth, um, one of the kids came downstairs to go to school one day and the director of that program had a three B's policy, policy as she used to call it, no butts, no boobs, no bellies. She when you're going to school, cause that's just not appropriate for any kid. And this one trans girl came downstairs to go to school one day and her entire midriff was showing. And the director said, go back upstairs and change. And the young person said, I have a right to wear clothing that expresses my gender. And the director said, right, that doesn't express your gender. <laughs> That's just inappropriate for school. So it's taking on that parent role, right? And helping young people understand that. So again, we do have a right to sort of police some of their behaviors, not their identity. Um, the reason that unobserved drug testing is so important is a lot of young people don't have access to medical intervention. They may not have access to hormonal therapy. Um, gender dysphoria is a diagnosis in the DSM-5. So when a young person says that they feel as though they're not in the right body, they go to a competent therapist, that therapist does a series of assessments. Um, if it's a matter of coping skills, if it's a matter of a sort of an effeminate boy or a sort of a butch girl, I know I'm using general terms, uh, it may be about they have to learn to cope with that as cisgender kids who are sort of outside the gender norm, right? Um, but for young people for, who are trans, who are really in the wrong body, that gender dysphoria diagnosis is really, really important because then it allows the, the, the physician to write prescription for hormones. 
that's why we keep kids on hormones. That's why kids can't be taken off hormones if they come into to our systems uh, once they're on them, because it, like any other medication, it's simply a response to a diagnosis or a diagnosable condition. Uh, and then some may or may not have had different surgeries. Again, it just sort of depends. Um, so the unobserved drug testing is sort of just to, to respect their bodily autonomy. Um, and all youth, regardless of gender identity expression, should be asked if they would prefer to be tested by a male or female staff. And that's going to be just case by case. A lot of this really is case by case. And the way that we have that information is by talking to them. And as I've said before, the more they trust us, the more honest they will be. Um, and do we have uh, policies and procedures to allow youth to participate? And by the way, I know I went over that very quickly as we've talked about, this is just sort of a wetting of the appetite to let you know sort of the broad stroke issues that are, are um, that we dig down more deeply into in training. Um, uh, so the programming is very important because, uh, you know, can they meet with other people? Can they have support groups? Is there, are there peer education programs? Um, are there theater programs? Are they things that they, that they want to do based on the stories that writing programs that they want to tell um, that will help them get the information out there and also help them sort of, you know, address the issues and whether or not they've had protection or rejection in their lives. Um, Again, you know, this is all the same as I've talked about. They should have access to it. The the the, the last point, though, the gender affirming medical care, uh, as I've said, uh, um, gender dysphoria is in the DSM. You know, uh, sexual orientation isn't in the DSM. It came out 50 years ago because there's no there's no treating it. There's no changing it. Um, it is good that gender dysphoria is in the DSM because again, once something is a diagnosable condition and has been diagnosed, then it takes it out of the sort of the, 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 the belief system realm and into the medical practice, which is where it belongs. Because if the, gender, if the gender dysphoria has been diagnosed, if then the therapist sends uh, the young person to a physician and the physician prescribes hormones, uh, and those hormones can take a couple of, let's see if I have some time yet, to, um, that can take a couple of courses. One is, as I said, kids have a good sense of their sense of gender at a very, very early age, two or three years old. So that's before puberty. So you may be aware of things called puberty blockers. And if a young person says, you know, at three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, uh, if even though I have a male body, I'm a little girl, or even though I have a female body, I'm a little boy, and they're working with a pediatrician and, and an endocrinologist who has had training, they may prescribe puberty blockers. And that just simply blocks puberty from starting when they get to be 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, because when a lot of those physiological changes happen, Adam's apples growing, hips widening, knuckles widening, uh, those can't be undone. What the puberty blockers do is allow the young person's front part of the brain, the frontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex that, as we know, does, doesn't start to develop until mid-teens, 15, 16, 17. So that's the, the tension, right? From a little kid, they know what their gender is, but their brain sort of hasn't really caught up to that. The puberty blockers give the brain a chance to develop. And most young people, this may surprise you, but most young people who've been prescribed puberty blockers when they get later on in teenage years and their, their brain is more fully developed, say, you know what? No, I'm not trans. Uh, and that's fine. That's their choice. They then can be weaned off like any medication. They're not just taken off of those hormones, but they're weaned off. Once they're weaned off, puberty just starts, just develops naturally and they start to menstruate or they start to grow, you know, other secondary sex characteristics. Um, so that's the, 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 the recommended approach, right? It's listening to the young person, taking them to competent uh, uh, practitioners, prescribing medications if they need. But then for those who do say, yes, this is me, these, these hormones help me align my body with my gender, uh, then that those hormones will be a lifelong um, factor in their lives and they'll be under a doctor's care like we do for any any medication. Surgeries are later um, for a whole bunch of reasons, legal reasons, policy reasons, uh, um, but we're not usually with young people dealing with those. Insurance companies now, most are covering gender affirming surgeries. Uh, so um, so that, that's covered once people are adults, but that's a whole sort of different thing. But that that piece on gender affirming care is more crucial now than ever before, because as we know, many, many states uh, are blocking that care. I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know that there won't be an Eighth Amendment case. To me, it does seem cruel and unusual to keep somebody in a body that they're not. 
uh, in, but, um, but there are a lot of wonderful legal experts on that, uh, working on that right now. Thanks, Jessica. Um, uh, so I, I, I have a feeling I'm sure those are gonna be changed. That's exactly the kind of thing that Lambda Legal takes on. Um, and, you know, this is, it all comes down to safety, right? I mean, that's, that's the main thing. It's, it's policies that, that present safety. As we talk about PREA, um, decisions on housing, again, it, it's a it's a case by case basis. Uh, PREA, it, the standards are very clear that gender identity is according to what the person says their gender, their gender identity is. I can't tell you how many facilities I've worked in, in jurisdictions I've worked in that have said, well, if they're on hormones, if they've had surgery, then we'll consider them. You may not. It is what the person asserts they are. Then it's asking them where they'll feel the safest. Um, uh, there's a, a big concern, and I've heard this over and over and over, that placing trans women, so many trans women still have male physiology, they still have a penis. Uh, putting a trans woman with a penis in a facility with cisgender female will increase the likelihood that they will sexually assault the cis women. There are no cases that have borne that out. Putting trans women in with cis men, the sexual assaults are through the roof. Uh, so it's usually just a matter of, you know, keeping them safe. Um, but again, it, it's a case by case basis. And Priya also instructs us to revisit the conversation. I was working in, in Arizona, I believe, once, and there was a trans girl in a juvenile facility who said she wanted to be um, in the girl's unit. So they put her in the girl's unit. And so they were doing each other's hair and they were all, it was all fine. Um, at one point, the young person went to the administration and said, I want to be in the boys unit. And they said, why? And she said, I can't have sex in the girls unit. I want to go to the boys unit so I can have sex. And they said, you can't have sex in the boys unit either. <laughs> so as I talked about early on, we support their orientation and their identity, but we absolutely have a right to control their behavior. <laughs> so they kept her in the girls unit. Um, that wasn't a violation of Priya. So, you know, I, you may have varying degrees of understanding about this, but PREA is a really good set of guidelines um, for helping us navigate these systems. Physical mental health, as we've talked about, uh, you know, I mentioned that the, the family acceptance projects research show that a kid is eight times more likely to try to kill themselves if we try to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, again, if you think back to the thing I talked about, about the palm sweating and the heart racing, Tell, telling someone to change that is simply impossible. Um, and so many, many states have outlawed this altogether. I assume it'll be at some point uh, outlawed federally, but what we know until that day comes is it does harm and we're just not in the business of doing more harm. So that's sort of the, the, the arc of the, you know, of, of what we can dig down more deeply into either in a a half a day training, a full day training, a multi day training of trainer series. Um, some final recommendations provide tailored services that are met, uh, that meet the underlying needs of LGBTQ plus youth. Uh, and by those underlying needs, what are they, right? They're the same needs every other, every young person has. They need to feel safe. They need to feel protected. They need to have basic life issues, clothing, food, shelter provided for them. They need educational opportunities. Uh, when I when I end a day of training, um, 20 years ago, I was part of a documentary, a documentary shot by the state of uh, Washington about many of their LGBTQ youth in care. And in that uh, process, I got to meet a, a, then a 12 year old gay identified boy and his very elderly um, African American foster mom who had moved to Washington state from the deep south. Um, she was so supportive of him coming out at 12 years old that about, I, got, I stayed in their lives for a long time, about 14, 15 years later, I went back and got to reshoot them to find out where they were in another little documentary. Um, and as a result of her support, providing him with not only clothing, food and shelter, but love advocacy when he was being bullied at school and teased at school, she went to the school and demanded that it stopped. When it didn't stop, she pulled her son out of that school put him into another school. So she was doing every single thing a parent should do to support their child. Um, as a result, he finished his undergraduate degree at 19, his master's at 20, he has a PhD and he owns a business now and two homes. Um, that all came from her. It's not rock and science in a lot of ways, right? If she had taken a different approach, if she had rejected him at 12, called the county and said, get this kid out of here as many, many people do, 
He would have internalized that pain. We would have lost all of that talent that now he's sharing with the world. Um, so, you know, when we talk about the basic underlying needs, it is all that. Um, check bias, check bias on staff. Um, again, help staff understand we're never talking about challenging their belief systems. We're here to talk about their practice, what they do when they're on the clock at work. Um, that is absolutely, we can absolutely uh, kind of, you know, challenge their bias if they're showing their bias there. This is also the point at which I talk about the need for supervision. Remember the story I told about the my coworker who didn't adopt my daughter uh, and how I didn't like to work with her and how my supervisor created that safe space for me. It is imperative that supervisors get training to provide those safe spaces because we don't want workers to have to say, to have to sort of suffer in their own silence, right? If this violates my faith, my culture, my belief system, whatever, I need a place to talk about that. The place to talk about that is not with my clients. It's not with the judge, or, you know, it, it's in, in a work situation, it is in supervision. And so how my supervisor can help me navigate that and bring those two things together uh, is a very, very important part of this. Um, train team members and stakeholders on what behaviors are helpful. Again, the Family Acceptance Project has a whole list of helpful behaviors and harmful behaviors. And those are all within our locus of control about which we want to, to, to do. Um, and staff should certainly not punish or behavior behavior that is uh, perceived, you know, on gender norms or things like that. Uh, when two seventh grade kids are in the back of math class, a boy and a girl say, and they're just sort of holding hands and giggling and kissing, um, the teacher will invariably say to them, stop doing that and pay attention. That's usually where it stops. If two girls or two boys are in the back of math class holding hands and kissing, a lot of times they'll get an extra message. The teacher will say, stop doing that and stop being who you are. That's what we wanna stop doing, right? Kids can never stop being who they are. If they do, if we do tell them that, again, it comes back to the pain that they will need to numb with substances or any other, a lot of other things. So they shouldn't be punished for who they are. As I've said, we have every right to, to control many behaviors. Let's stick to the behaviors that are universally applied. Um, if 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 a, if a foster parent says, uh, you know, my my foster daughter can't bring a girlfriend home, but she could bring a boyfriend home, that's not right. That's not fair. But the parent absolutely has a right to say, kids in my house don't get to date. They're too young. That's fine, right? That's that's as long as it's equally applied. So again, a lot of these resources, the the out of the margin study. There's a, a special edition of the L, uh, LGBTQ edition of the journal Child Welfare that has. Um, 16 different studies in it, uh, dependency and delinquency systems across the board, very good research projects. Uh, the Hidden Injustice Report, as I talked about, the opening doors for uh, the guide that the ABA created for lawyers and judges. Uh, it's Your Life uh, is a guide. Um, Breaking the Silence is a series of, of digitized stories where you hear from 10 young people firsthand. They're three or four minute stories, very brief, but they're told by the young people. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, where they talk about how they were accepted and or rejected and how they had to deal with that. Those guidelines I talked about for managing systems, uh, Street Child, a wonderful, wonderful memoir that Justin Reed early wrote, Family Acceptance Project. Some of the research I talked about, about young people knowing, having a good idea of their gender from a very early age, the research is, is uh, in the Transgender Child book. Um, and again, OJJDP has a lot of resources. Uh, when Keith Towery was running the, that's, uh, that department, he really built up a lot of resources. So if that could just be your one-stop shop, that and the National SOGI Center. Uh, and as I talked about, Shea Bilchik's uh, Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. Um, so lots and lots of resources for you. Um, so that's sort of the, the broad strokes. I know, you know, sort of the, the limits of this sort of system is a lot of me talking at you, which is not what a training is <laughs> when we're in the room. Um, but hopefully it imparted a certain amount of information that will, will help you along the way. But um, Jessica, do we have other questions that we can? We don't have questions yet. So folks, if you do have a specific question and you'd like Rob to address it, you can put it right into chat now. Um, or you can even raise your hand and we'll unmute you or you can unmute yourself and you can talk out loud if you'd like. Um, I do wanna let you know that um, we have funding uh, at NCJFCJ and All Rise to provide juvenile drug treatment courts with training and technical assistance on topics like this. So if you think that you would like to undertake um, a deeper dive, give me a call, call your grant, um, your site liaison, um, 
send us an email. We are happy to send Rob out to you. Um, happy to to help you really explore these issues and create your own policies and procedures. Um, and uh, and hopefully, um, I'm trying to figure out if I can it can pay for uh, one of the train the trainers that Rob was talking about, where we would pay for your travel to come and learn all of these things so you could take it back and train um, in your own jurisdictions. I think it would be incredibly helpful if we could really spread out to the number of people that are doing this work um, to make sure that we really are getting a good saturation because um, it, I think there's so many really easy things that we can do for kids in the system to help them feel safe and protected. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of you are already doing those things. I just wanna make sure everybody is. So um, um, let me look again if there are any questions, Rob. I'm not seeing anything. Lots of people are saying thank you. They do want your slides. So we're gonna post this webinar on our website. We'll also send you out all of the slides so you have um, at easy access to the um, to the resources. But again, feel free to call on uh, NCJ, FCJ, or All Rise if you have questions and would like to do more. Um, and I hope you will. All right, Rob, I wanna thank you very much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you all. And I really, I, I thank you all for attending this because by that it just signals that you want to, to, to keep going in this. And by the way, you wouldn't be alone. A lot of states already have jumped into this. Uh, I mean, I've trained huge systems in Texas and Indiana and Utah, uh, Alaska. Um, so this is sort of just jumping on a train that's already running down the tracks. Um, yeah, so and I think it's great that, that there is nothing that has to be created here. There's stuff that gets compromised or compromised. Um, customized for your jurisdiction. So you can take all of these things that have already been created and figure out how it fits where you're at and just implement. So I think that it's amazing that you can, can really bring to bear all of those different um, efforts that have happened already. Great. Uh, all right. Thank you all very much. Um, please again, feel free to reach out. Uh, we will have another Tune In Tuesday in November. You can look for that advertisement coming up um, in the next couple of weeks. And uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Sure. Bye.